Thank you. Uh, today's topic is scaling ironic. And by scaling, we don't mean climbing, although you could possibly climb ironic in terms of learning knowledge and so on and so forth, but I'll just ramble. Um, actually, before I really dive into this, um, I do want to thank everyone, every large operator that has ever talked to the ironic community <laughs> and expressed uh, frustration or feedback and has really guided us a long way. CERN, Yahoo, even uh, the folks in NVIDIA have provided us feedback and we, a lot of it we've been able to action, take action upon and really improve some of the user experience. So a little bit of information uh, that we're gonna talk about today is the architecture roughly from 10,000 feet. This is a lot of theory, how it is supposed to work. I'll talk about a couple different options that are available. Um, and really this is up to you, however you wish to deploy your environment. And then I'll talk about some common pitfalls and lesser known details. Um, after that, I'll talk about some solutions. These solutions are mostly for ironic and I'll talk about inspector. Um, inspector is a special topic in this case because it is different and has a different use case. So first, the architecture from 10,000 feet. Before I diving into this, I found this quote from Terry Pratchett, which I thought was very interesting. If you don't know where you come from, then you don't know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, then you're probably wrong. And that kind of feels very appropriate in this case, because in order to administer and run a large infrastructure deployment, you really have to understand the lower level details. These are things that tend to be forgotten or uh, knowledge that's actually being lost in our society because you know technology is becoming so advanced, but there's still the lower level infrastructure. And that's kind of the reason why we're all here actually. So at the highest level, Ironic has an API service, which you can have any number of. It uses a message bus and a database. And then you have an ironic conductor and you have any number of conductors. And the theory at a high level is that the database for the API is read only, only if the conductor writes to the database. The API sends commands or requests to the conductor over the message bus and the conductor replies over the message bus. And there's two different options. You can, one can use RabbitMQ as the message bus through Oslo messaging or one can use JSON RPC. Um, Ironic is very much agnostic to the two. Um, we have explicit support. The real driver behind using JSON RPC was just to eliminate RabbitMQ as a component uh, to like, enable smaller deployments. Um, another probably a, a, an important aspect of this is Ironic doesn't store any persistent data on the message bus. It's merely a pass through. Uh, communications channel. So JSON RPC works very well for this as well. So again, the message bus is used for transactional information, requests and responses. The database is a persistent data store. It That database has the details, the state information, everything that guides how the software works. So largely when we look at the distribution of work, Requests can be distributed across the APIs, and you can have, depending on how you set up your environment, in essence, any number of APIs talking to any number of conductors. There's probably some scalability limits here that Arnie's probably hit himself. Um, that being said, the way it, it works is when you request something that has to go to a conductor, it chooses the most appropriate conductor based upon the hash ring of the node. And when I say the hash ring of the node, we distribute machines by um, a consistent hash ring that is a calculation of mapping the node name to the actual physical hardware. Uh, there are a couple cases where this is not the case, like creating new nodes, it gets sent to whatever conductor can handle the request. Uh, but generally this is how requests get distributed. So your API may get a request, it will send it along to whatever conductor is the most appropriate or the conductor responsible for managing the node. 
the conductors themselves have that consistent hash ring. They assign nodes to that via that consistent hash ring. And they are essentially responsible for all the managing of state of that node and that interaction. So that's the theory. <laughs> now, I'm going to dive into some common uh, issues and pitfalls and lesser known details about how all this works. API requests, specifically. In Wallaby, we added a bunch of uh, role-based access control logic. And we measured the performance. And it was atrocious, uh, far worse than we had previously. And so we spent some time during the Xena cycle to actually clean up this uh, performance, these bottlenecks and the optimization of the code and how we do this uh, request processing and managed to increase performance quite a bit. And we back toward these patches. But before Xena, Ironic only, re only removed unrequested data from a request. So if you can imagine, uh, you're packing a box full of information from the database. You're sending it to the web server. The web server takes this giant box of data, starts unpacking it, and throws out 90% of the data. So that was the thing we were running into quite a bit. So at this point, now what we do is we only return the requested data and the essential fields to the API. And then return that response based upon what is requested. So if you say, give me the node detail for all of the machines, yes, it's going to be slow. Uh, under the hood, it's doing thousands of data conversions um, for a list of 100 machines. So it's, it's very resource intensive to do a detailed list. If you do a column-based list or say, I need these three fields, it can be much faster. Uh, this was previously kind of in place, but not it really wasn't performant and actually generated more database queries when you did it, um, which was kind of actually surprising when we dug into how the backend SQL interaction worked. And for example, uh, an image provided by CERN, um, this is an, their maximum response times after they upgraded or before, during, and after, I believe. And you can kind of see the amount of time that was spent for API request processing on average dropped substantially. Uh, my benchmarks locally ran about 5.7 times faster. I believe uh, Arnie posted something much, much larger, <laughs> but it really depends on what you're doing. Go ahead. Yeah, it's about 10 times I measured about 10 times. And you can also see like in, in the, on the left side of the picture, there's even a, a structure which shows the, the pagination, for instance. So you can see like how we get nodes in chunks by I think 1000. Um, so there's all kinds of structure. The structure is still there, but it's now like in the right-hand side is like much more condensed, but it's roughly a factor of, of yeah, eight to 10, I would say it's fast I know. Excellent, that, that makes me feel really good as someone who spent a lot of time on this. So where this has a huge impact though is the Nova to ironic synchronization. And the way at a high level that this works is Nova maintains, or Nova compute processes maintain a cache of nodes. They co basically constantly repull or semi constantly repull and update that cache with new entries as they appear. However, this is a lot of overhead. Um, where this, these patches really make a huge difference, though, is in getting that data because a huge amount of that time that was being sent, spent by that Nova compute was just the retrieval from Ironic. There is another bottleneck inside Nova uh, that I won't really talk about, uh, but long story short, it's data manipulation processing that causes some bottlenecks, which is why one might want to run many Nova computes. We can talk about that a little, a little bit more about that in a minute. But the bottom line is the Nova compute process does do a heavy lift with all of this data. Additionally, one thing we did find is some operators were having to, were finding they were needing to restart Nova computes uh, to address issues in their environment uh, due to race conditions uh, in the actual list processing. 
because it could take so long for this list to be processed. We found that we were doing unnecessary BIF attachments or virtual interfaces, and we've actually stripped that out of the uh, interaction. So now the compute process should actually start much faster. I know uh, a particular operator that's on this call that uh, actually was the inspiration for me fixing that because uh, I wanted to feel the need for coffee one morning <laughs> or something like that. And uh, they were having to restart and it was taking an atrocious amount of time. I felt really bad about it. That operator may have played up the impact of that event slightly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so before we, we really move on, I think it's important that we kind of understand the process model of Ironic. Every conductor launches at actions with what's called a task. Each task operates on a green thread. Wow. Driver periodic tasks. And these are things like, is this task done? Or can I resume this task? Or uh, is the computer done? Or has the state changed? Or RAID configuration finished? Or BIOS configuration finished? All of these things are tasks. And by default, the conductor can do 100 tasks. And a huge consumer of this is power synchronization. And this is actually one of the huge bottlenecks that can exist in environments. Internally, also, Ironic has only two reserved green threads. We've not found this necessary to extend, but largely this is just used for uh, one that's reserved for basically the database heartbeat saying, I'm working, I'm alive. And the other is reserved for heartbeat processing from agents. But most of the conductor time is actually spent orchestrating actions, hence the name conductor. So I mentioned PowerSync. And PowerSync is an core feature of Ironic. It's an extremely useful feature of Ironic. We found hyperscalers that operate at scales of 40 to 250,000 nodes or so tend to have to turn this off. Um, and largely because it is an aggressive process that updates the power status. So it can be reflected to users in relatively short order. Obviously you don't want to have a machine lose power and have all the APIs say, yes, it's alive, it's working, everything's fine. That's not ideal. Especially if you have other processes that may automatically kick off or launch new instances, you kind of get the idea at that point. So a common setting that's used is to actually change the interval to make it longer. We did make improvements to this back in March, 2021. And I believe we changed the threading model a little bit around this, uh, but largely this is still a very process intensive operation that just runs in the background. And I think the defaults every five minutes or 10 minutes. So one of the things that actually Stern uh, found was that we were doing extra work. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, we like to be very thorough. So they were kind enough to implement uh, lazy loading for the data structures. And we can see that this actually had a, a huge impact in the performance of Ironic in terms of the amount of database queries that were occurring. Because you don't, if you're just doing a list of nodes or you're just working on one task, you don't necessarily need the ports or the uh, drivers or any other related information. So Obviously, we cut down the number of queries, the more concurrency that can occur in an environment. These patches were, down, were backported all the way through Stein, uh, which is quite old at this point, um, but it should be a huge performance improvement. And this is probably, in addition to the API and performance improvements, is just another reason operators really should try and run more up-to-date versions. It's actually very difficult and resource intensive for us to get patches down to say Stein. So the other issue with PowerSync is IPMI. Ironic uses the operating system provided IPMI tool binary to talk to each machine individually. This has a huge benefit of abstracting a number of details away from Ironic, 
in terms of retry handling, ciphers. Um, these are, but these are still things sometimes we need to set or know about to pass into IPMI tool to address certain cases. But the bottom line is this process is resource intensive to launch because it's native C binary. And Python's execution of, of other binaries is also CPU intensive. So it's CPU intensive to launch it. It's CPU intensive to operate it briefly. And if you start doing the math with default settings, if you have a cluster of 250 nodes or one conductor with 250 nodes, it launches or it will try and launch 15,000 uh, IPMI tool commands an hour, which is a enormous workload. And if you have a cluster with a thousand machines, this can easily reach a million IPMI calls, which seems insane, but it is extremely resource intensive. A path forward to prevent <laughs> this resource intensive use is to use Redfish. Redfish uses a native client that caches sessions that tries to be a bit more or much more efficient and it's not causing uh, a system binary to be executed every single time, which is causing libraries to be loaded and processed, so on and so forth. So if you can use Redfish, I would highly advise it for scaling any ironic clusters just because of the amount of performance gain that you'll have just based upon not using IPMI tool. Another reason not to use IPMI tool is it's incredibly insecure. And when I say insecure, I mean exceptionally insecure. Um, for those that aren't aware, if you, or in most cases, and in what the specification says, if you fail authentication, it sends you the encrypted ha hash of the password <laughs> so that you can try and, val try and figure out what your password was basically, and it's just awful. <laughs> Um, so please don't use IPMI if you can avoid it. <laughs> so going back to periodic tasks, uh, another strategy that is often used by operators is to disable unneeded periodic tasks. So if you're not doing things like RAID configuration or firmware updates, these have periodic tasks wrapped around them, you largely to complete state and move the conductor to the next task. These queries have been optimized to try and minimize load, minimize creation of tasks, but still additional load. It's still additional database queries, sorting through nodes. So if you don't absolutely need it and you need to scale, consider evaluating periodic tasks that exist. And usually you can see these in the ironic conductor configuration by looking at anything named with an interval. <laughs> um, not everything is an interval. Uh, some explicit hard pauses for a task are intervals as well, but generally everything named interval is a periodic task timer or used in that calculation. So if you set those values to zero, generally um, that means don't run the task. Also, one thing to note is even if you don't use a driver in an environment, if it's enabled, its periodic tasks will still run. This is part of the driver design model, and it's kind of handy, but at the same time, if you're running many machines and you have 2% extra, da uh, extra database queries in your environment that are unnecessary work, you might want to disable them. So here are some solutions I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I know I've been talking about solutions and how to kind of navigate these things, but largely those are pitfalls and aspects that are somewhat known, but not commonly talked about. So one of the things when we talk about scaling ironic is just add more conductors. The hash ring, which I mentioned earlier, will distribute nodes across the hash ring. So you can increase the number of nodes and increase the number of conductors, and that will scale. However, <laughs> there is a general happy place where operators tend to find an ideal conductor to machine ratio. And this is largely for operators running IPMI. 
um, or a large number of IPMI nodes because of that uh, computational overhead of launching processes. And generally, the operators have, have provided feedback of somewhere between 250 and 500. I would say 250 is no longer really the, the happy place. I would say in another two years with improvements in processors, that might be 750. But again, this depending, it all depends on your workload, your drivers, everything you're doing. I will say that some operators have achieved tens of thousands of nodes per conductor. These operators are the ones that tend to turn off power synchronization though, which as I mentioned, is the most resource intensive operation. So as I mentioned earlier, you can scale the number of APIs, you can spell, scale the number of conductors, but at some point you start running into some logistical issues. Your database is one aspect where you might run into problems. We've not tested it in the ironic community, but an option may exist and the community would probably be more than happy to help explore this. But the OsloDB service does, or not service, library does allow for what are called uh, secondary databases or read-only databases to be loaded in terms of URL paths to additional read replicas. That allows read queries to go to one database or any number of databases, which could be behind a load balancer, <laughs> which could allow the service to scale even more. So when adding more conductors, you do want to sequence your restarts. And this is largely because there is a hash rank calculation there are database updates that have to occur, especially if you do a full complete cold, cold start where you shut everything down. That tends to cause a huge spike in database activity, loading all the nodes, starting all the tasks, and Nova starting to sync. And you can just imagine how this kind of goes. And this is a graph provided by CERN where you can kind of see their running environment. They shut everything down. And then they started everything up and you can see the queries per second actually just go through the roof. Um, I believe the, the next section until about 2 p.m. UTC was uh, when they were trying to figure out what was going on. Right. And I believe the next section was when they started to introduce a, uh, a sequencing into it. Right. Go ahead. So, so it's basically like, I mean, as, as you said, it's absolutely correct. So it's, it basically shows like on the very left hand side before the upgrade, then everything was shut down. Everything was started at the same time. Then the first sequence until 2 p.m. is without the patches that actually do the lazy loading because I branched off a little bit before that patch. Um, but I ran with that patch before as so you can see on the right, on the left hand side. So I was like totally confused while all of a sudden the database goes, goes crazy. I realized at around two um, and then the last step is around like seven when I sequence out the restarts. So basically the, 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 the restarts of the conductors are staged and smeared out rather than all synchronized, which would all hit the database at the same time. So this is the different phases that you see. So in the end, if you look at the very right, you see it's like lower database activity and it's more, it's less spiky than on the very left. But yeah, <laughs> we had to go through multiple stages here. This how many generally... conductors were uh, here and how much interval did you do the sequencing? Like how long did you delay before starting the conductors? Right. Okay, so this is for around um, 8,000 physical nodes. At that time, we had around 8,000 physical nodes. It's 25 conductors. And the, the start is like a random number between the, the stage restart is between 30 and 90 seconds. So basically, basically I go, yeah, it's like this. So I basically go one by one and then leave 30 to 90 seconds in between the start of each. So it takes like uh, 40 minutes or so to restart it. Okay, great. Does that affect issues though with hash rings either on the Nova side or the ironic side? So the Nova hash ring is independent of the ironic hash ring. So it has no insight into if conductors are alive or not. 
it trusts the API service will get the request to the de destination endpoint. Right, and then we have um, conductor groups which map the nodes directly to a conductor. So okay, yeah, thanks. Well, I think the next slide is actually conductor groups. Yes, it is conductor groups. <laughs> so conductor groups is a concept that we created to kind of represent physical realities. Um, there are scale limitations to environments. Uh, there are geographic limitations where you don't need or want a conductor in, say, New York managing machines in London. <laughs> or you don't need data center row C talking data center row A. So the idea is to use conductor groups where you delineate the hash ring further by stating to the to ironic, this is in, con in conductor group, say A, and conductor group A will only have con only have nodes assigned into that hash ring based upon the actual configuration of the nodes. So if you have two conductors for conductor group A, then all of your other nodes will end up on other, other conductors. This is kind of useful for those physical realities and preventing these sorts of things, but it can actually be used and also query directly from Nova Compute to limit the scope and view of the Nova Compute process as well. So kind of an idea where this ends up heading is you almost start splitting the infrastructure. So you can have a distinct set of Nova computes. You can have one set of Ironic APIs or multiple sets of Ironic APIs. They can run with different configuration and they can share the same database or same configuration and share the same database. And then you can run multiple groups of conductors depending on your needs and your load. You may have a group that does not need power synchronization as often that might just be doing long-term batch processing. And you might have conductors for instances that you want to keep a state inf the state information as up-to-date as possible so you can provide your users with input or feedback so they know, oh, my machine's off, or oh, I need to do something on my machine, or so on and so forth. And one of the useful things is you can run these conductors with different configurations. So, they'll have a, a configuration saying, I'm in this conductor group, but you can say, here's your intervals, here's your timers, and here's uh, your boot default boot settings or your drivers even. So you have a lot of power and probably going back to the hash ring, drivers are also delineators in the hash ring. It's just conductor groups are before drivers in the hash ring calculation. So this is uh, a slide of CERN's layout. And you can kind of see what Arnie was talking about in terms of they have Nova computes with conductor group configuration assigned to ironic conductors, in essence, uh, with specific conductor configuration so that those, that pool of machines is, or that those interactions are limited to that environment or into that scope. So you can say, oh, I wanna run all these processes on one machine, or I need to run it in this physical area or data center A, data center B, and kind of the sky's the limit uh, in terms of what you end up with and how you wanna work with this. Right, if I may add one, one example, one additional example of what Julia just described um, is like you can, she said this on the, on the previous slide as well, is that you can like have different configurations and this is also what we have here and what I also try to like show a little bit in the picture. So if you go to the conductor group N, which is the leading group, you could have like more conductors because this um, is maybe the group where new nodes are added. So there's more activity in the beginning because you have inspection and you have cleaning and you have deployment and then it gets more calm for the, uh, for the conductor. So one conductor is maybe good enough. Another thing that we do is like in this leading group where we add new nodes, we have fast track enabled. So uh, in the leading, well, well, it's not exactly this. We have another group, which is group zero, if you like, where we have fast track enabled. So the nodes go through inspection, cleaning, and so on, benchmarking, burn-in, without rebooting. 
and there is no Nova conductor, or sorry, no Nova compute for this group um, at all. Uh, and we have multiple nodes in there. So basically the, the team that is enrolling new hardware uses this group in order to like, it's like a waiting room for Ironic and they do all their stuff like benchmarking burn in there. Um, there's no Nova compute that is interfering in any way. There's fast track. And once they're done, I move them to the corresponding conductor group uh, where they're then deployed. So these conductor groups are really, in, in addition to scaling, um, of a lot of possibility to do additional configuration that suits your, your workflows. We introduced them mostly for scaling because of Nova compute, because of the time it takes for the resource tracker to find all these nodes. This is why we chunked it up uh, into smaller pieces. But then we discovered that we can do a lot more with these. So it's, it's really a very powerful concept. There are some pitfalls to this powerful concept, specifically if you have a node already in Nova and change the conductor group. Um, specifically, the Nova Compute Code doesn't understand this or handle this very well. Um, there are some discussion and patches that are work in progress to try and remedy this situation. It's actually a couple different interaction uh, issues with the design of Nova and the, how it tracks resources. So hopefully sometime in the near future, we'll have this largely resolved and a patch that we can backport to older branches to try and make this seamless and just be a thing. And this is, this is even an issue if you don't, when you don't have an instance on the node. So with an instance, I would not have dared to like reshuffle things between conductor go, uh, groups, but I thought without an instance, eh, what does Nova care? But it does care <laughs> and I screwed it up big time. So there's a big warning, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's one of the, one of the issues that's why we're wanting to fix this issue is because Nova thinks that, oh, this is a physical compute node that runs VMs, not bare metal, and thinks, oh, this is no longer in the cluster. It's gone. I delete the record. That record might have appeared elsewhere. It doesn't know it. Or the one that issues a delete doesn't know it. And it's just, it is what it is right now. Hopefully, it'll be fixed soon. Now I want to talk about Ironic Inspector because this is a different topic. Why would you want to scale Ironic Inspector is probably a good question because Ironic Inspector's usage is largely intended for when you add nodes or enroll them originally. So if you want to add a bunch of nodes at one time, it might be useful. Another case is active node introspection. And there are some important things to keep in mind with Ironic Inspector. It has the ability to have a scaling model similar to Ironic. However, most operators only launch it as a single process. We have mixed messages if you can actually run it with load balancers and it works or not. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, next two slides actually. The issues in Inspector largely are that it has an, some internal state, which is very much not exactly load balancer friendly. Often Inspector ends up being configured without a real database, which compounds this problem. The internal caching code has been improved <laughs> so that you don't necessarily run into this issue. However, if you're running a much older version, you probably don't have the patch to fix this issue and it might not work. And if you're using load balancers, depending on what you're using, you may need to require a bug fix. In, in short, Inspector is not really ready to scale, but it was never really intended or designed to do so. So back to load balancers. We recently discovered a bug in Inventlet of all places. The long story, as short as possible, is that Eventlet made some bad decisions or bad uh, decisions is not the right word. They read the RFC one way and they didn't read the next paragraph. <laughs> um, and in essence, they thought all empty replies are treated one way. And in reality, empty replies are treated a little bit differently if you have a return, return code of 204, which is what Inspector will use in two cases. 
this was causing some, some versions of HA proxy to actually fail the request processing completely. Uh, we found Apache kind of handles this and masks it, but sometimes not. And this is kind of where we're getting some mixed signaling. We're not entirely sure. So we have created a patch to try and fix this. Uh, I've had feedback saying both it works and not doesn't work. So I'm kind of hope, hoping we'll figure this one out soon. But the eventlet uh, maintainers were quite responsive when we point out the RFC and the actual what the code is supposed to do. So I'm hopeful that a future version of that eventlet will be fixed. So now is time for questions and comments and everything else that makes us so valuable of an experience for everyone and ourselves. Thanks a lot, Julia, for this great overview of all the work that has gone into scaling ironic. Do we have questions? Just uh, speak up. Comments, user uh, experiences. At, at what point um, did you find, <clears throat> excuse me, at what point did you find that tuning the power sink uh, actually became necessary uh, for performance in, her, in your environments uh, number of nodes or processes or what what was your trigger to realize hey by turning down the power sink i can trying to if, if somebody is encountering these types of performance issues what would they be looking for in order to say hey turning this down or turning this up or off would uh potentially help and improve my environment my feeling would be task exhaustion would be uh, some, a, a solid sign of this issue. Uh, high database load, high CP load on the conductor for the most part. Um, would this be like looking for the, your task has outlasted the process by 27 seconds in the log, be a trigger that somebody would use to look for these things? I don't believe we actually have logging for that. In terms of, I think that's tasks. more on the Nova side that does that. But I'm just, yeah. But there's like the, the periodic task when it runs into itself. That's the, at least the the time. So if it hasn't finished, like it, I think the default, as Julia said, was 60 seconds. I don't know if that changed now to 300 seconds or something. But what we saw is at some point the task was running into itself and did not finish actually. And and this was at a couple of thousand nodes already. It it ran into itself. This is when we like increased it. And there's also like uh, parameters that were um, introduced, I don't know, two or three years ago, where you could like have these power swing calls and the IPM calls in parallel. So we also play with this a little bit. But there's, um, as, as you know, the, the, the core has also pointed out, there's um, with IPMI, there's all kinds of delays that are not always under full control. There's, um, it, it's very unpredictable. But I, I think for us, what it was was at some point the power swing was running into itself and then we increased the interval. It's in in our, our particular case, we ended up seeing um, folks on the CLI end up with six out of six tries and uh, you know, please retry your operation again. And it was literally because the API was swamped with power checks. It's not the API that gets swamped with the power checks. It's a conductor thread, running out of conductor threads because it's waiting. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yes. Thank you for, for correcting me. So that's that's a solid indicator of time to scale my deployment quite a bit. And <laughs> when you start running uh, the CLI command, start returning six out of six retries failed. <laughs> yeah. Talking about um, like like scaling the deployment, do do we have numbers actually of? For instance, number of API nodes per n number of nodes. Because what we're, the way we have deployed it is basically we have like all in one ironic controllers that always have an API, a conductor, and an inspector. And I just scale them out horizontally. While for other components, for instance, for Nova, we basically split the API from the conductor and we have, um, depending on the needs, more or less uh, API nodes than conductor nodes. Um, so do we have any like uh, rule of thumb, like how many API nodes you would need for 
like a deployment with Nova per, I don't know, N nodes or something? I don't think we do. And largely this is kind of an artifact of the launch, the process launch model. Uh, if you do a native uh, launch of the API, um, I believe it will launch workers based on the number of CPUs you have. Mm -hmm. um, so if you expose, say, 90 CPUs, I think you used to actually try and launch 90 workers right. or something absurd like that. Yeah. I think that's been toned down by default. But another common launch pattern is actually use WSGI. And say if you use it with, w with Apache, you may run into a situation where your configuration is, oh, I'm only, well, let me clarify. Your configuration might be such that you say, I only want two concurrent requests to be uh, processed or accessible, which is really not ideal for an API surface. Mm. Uh, th and this is workers and threads count, thread counts, basically in the uh, WSGI app. Workers are useful in case you have one of the processes die. However, that's not really been a reported issue. The threads are um, really where it's kind of as useful as much as workers based on the number of processors and the amount of workload that you have in your environment. And that's going to depend on what you have and how you're working with it and the scale at which you're running. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we have a hard and fast number because there are, there's really three or four different ways you could launch the API and run it and configure it and have it working in an environment. And there's also going to be additional overhead, say if you're terminating SSL on the, pro on the end process versus terminating SSL with a load balance or, or something like Apache, mm -hmm. because running all that trans, all that uh, encapsulation through additional layers does add overhead. However, say if it's Apache, it's much closer to C and the CPU and more optimized interactions. I wish we had numbers yeah. and I would love to yeah. talk about their experiences here. Well, it's, it's more like, the, I mean, as I said a couple of times, I'm more because I pack everything into one controller and then like add controllers as I see fit, but I never made use of the fact that I could actually split APIs and conductors and the inspector actually, I just like replicate them and then it, it seems to be working okay. So I was just wondering oh. if it works well. well. Inspe Inspector is is probably the weakest point in right. all of Ironic in mm -hmm. terms of scaling and operation. But active node inspection and and inspecting number of nodes were not really original use cases right. for Inspector. They were they were bolted on or made logical sense of oh I need to update this one machine's data or I need to add these ten machines. So right, everyone's yep. mileage will vary or kilometers. Go ahead. Yeah, just, just to add on this, so for those who, who wonder what active introspection is, um, so active introspection is when you run on a deployed instance, the inspector in order to update inventory data that um, the inspector would provide. Um, and we have just done this because there was at the original inspection, when we run it, there was a bug in the version of LS hardware that we used. And it reported zero RAM and that went into our inventory system. And then these nodes that actually went unnoticed, the nodes went into production. And at some point later, someone noticed like, hey, all these nodes don't have RAM in our inventory. There's something wrong. So we reran introspection via a container that we built uh, and updated that information. And this is like uh, when we needed to do introspection at scale. Well, at some scale with 200 nodes, but still um, we may run this on a couple of thousand nodes in order to update some other data that is missing, where this came, came in very handy that we had this feature of active introspection. Julia, Julia if, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, you deployed that as a container. Was the, uh, was the underlying uh, operating system on those nodes capable of supporting that container natively, or did you have to install all of that support? My, my concern is going out and installing a bunch of stuff on users' machines. Right, um, so I was lucky the, the set of nodes that I, where I was needing to do this, it's part of our batch cluster, and they had all the infrastructure already there. So I'd, all I needed to do is basically run one line Docker command, which holds the container, executes it, and then with the um, parameters that were actually provided, um, 
that you can pass to the active introspection, which is the, the interval where you can say, okay, run only once. I think if you emit the interval or something, it runs only once, so the container exits, the container is cleaned up, the command exits, and you, you're all done. Okay, the image is still cached there, but okay, apart from this, everything is cleaned up. So it's a very, very neat way of doing this, updating the, the introspection data afterwards, after the fact, actually. And since we moved from, um, or the, the first half of our nodes has not been um, inspected with all the hardware details, so there's this extra hardware collector where you get actually more hardware information, like much more detailed. And we only enabled this after we had enrolled a couple of thousand nodes. And we want to have this detailed information. We will run a campaign and run this on all the other 4,000 nodes. But yeah, we may have to introduce uh, or install some additional tools. We have to see how it goes for that. OK, more questions or comments? I have one more comment. I think one very nice takeaway from, from this work and, and this session is also that like operator feedback actually works. So many of the things that we have seen here is actually we're triggered by operators saying like, hey, this is suboptimal. Can we do something about this? And then like upstream, if they find the time or if the, the problem is big enough, like go along and actually fix things. And you saw some of the massive improvements in, in the graphs that Julia shared. And this is like, like an awesome collaboration or feedback loop between operations and, and like how the code is improved. So I find this quite amazing. And you saw multiple instances of this in the presentation today. It's really cool. It is the most powerful interaction open source to get to have a feedback loop that's working, operating, and gives us the requirements and experiences that we can take back and use this context moving forward. Mm. And uh, I really do want to thank all the operators that have expressed frustration and feedback <laughs> constructively um, that have really helped us move this forward because it's really amazing the scale some of the operators have reached. There are obviously lots of config changes some operators have had to do, even some code changes themselves. Uh, but getting this stuff back into the community, getting this information out there is kind of vital in terms of making it easier because people can run ironic with one machine or one machine to deploy another, or they can run it to deploy thousands of thousands and thousands of machines. It just really depends on how they want to run. Great. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Julia, again, and thanks everyone for joining and, uh, See you next time around.